hello and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I have had quite a few requests in my comment sections to cover the individual that we are going to be looking at today. She has been mentioned in passing in another video that I made, but that one was about one of her husbands, a man with whom I do have my own issues. Never mind, you can check it out. I will be leaving it linked. That video was also from ages ago. And so quite frankly, I think that it's just about time that we take a look at Catherine Willoughby in her own right. Catherine Willoughby was born in 1519 to William Willoughby, who was the 11th Baron Willoughby de Airsby, and to his wife Maria. Catherine was her parents' only child. William held a considerable portfolio of properties across the east of England. They were in Lincolnshire, Norfolk and Suffolk, and combined, they were worth more than £900 a year. If we check out the National Archives currency converter, we're going to learn pretty quickly that £900 in 1520, which is of course around the time that Catherine was born, was worth the equivalent of approximately £468,000 in 2017 money. William had married Maria in 1516, which is of course around three years before their daughter Catherine was born. William might have had the money, and indeed the properties, but Maria is the one with the profile. She had been born Maria de Salinas, and Maria was one of the Spanish ladies that travelled to England to be a part of Catherine of Aragon's household. It is thought that Maria may have travelled with her mistress in 1501, when she set off to marry Arthur, Prince of Wales. Alternatively, but probably less likely, she may have joined her household at a later date. So it's possible then that she would have been at Catherine's side when she became a widow, and then also during those difficult and painful years that followed. In 1511, Maria was certainly in England because she stood as godmother to Mary, Charles Brandon's second daughter by his second wife, Anne Brown. Or perhaps she was his first wife? I suppose it all depends on how you're going to untangle the legalities of pre-contracts, consummations, firstborn children, marriages and annulments between two women who were in fact aunt and niece to each other. Now, as I said, I have linked the video about Charles Brandon, so I'm not going to go on too much here. Do check it out if you'd like more information about this particular kerfuffle. By 1514, Maria had risen to such a position of trust and indeed prominence with her royal mistress, who was by now Queen of England, as she had married King Henry VIII around five years before this, that Ferdinand of Aragon's ambassador complained about Maria. He was worried about her influence over Catherine, and he said as much in his letters to Catherine's father back in Spain. As I mentioned, Maria would marry William in 1516, which was the same year that Catherine of Aragon would give birth to the Princess Mary. William Willoughby, though, had his own connection to his king's best friend, because he had fought under Charles Brandon in the campaigns in France. Further to this, Brandon had been willing to act as fair fee for Maria's jointure at the time of their marriage. But by this point, Brandon was also the king's brother-in-law, following his audacious marriage to Henry's sister Mary, which had occurred with scandalous speed following the death of her first husband, Louis XII of France. And thus, from the very start of their married life, Maria and William were a couple that was entangled with the households of both Henry VIII through their twinned connections to Charles Brandon, but also to Catherine of Aragon through the person of Maria herself. It was into this rarefied world that Catherine Willoughby was born in 1519. It's thought that she may have been named for the Queen, who might also have stood as her godmother. On the 19th of October 1526, when little Catherine was just seven, her father William died. Now, 
Maria would need to fight to defend her daughter's rights as his inheritrix. And this is going to be against the claims of the late Lord Willoughby's brother, Sir Christopher. There were lawsuits in relation to this dispute, and they were heard in both Chancery and Star Chamber. If, however, her inheritance could be secured, Catherine would be a very wealthy young woman, and thus, understandably, a most attractive bride for a whole host of noble families. Enter Charles Brandon once again. He negotiated a deal that allowed him to purchase Catherine's wardship, and also to make a plan for a future marriage between her and his son and heir, Henry, Earl of Lincoln. Through this, Catherine would be married to the nephew of King Henry VIII, who was also, of course, the only legitimate and English-born grandson of King Henry VII, at least for the time being. As for the king, he was at this time most preoccupied with his so-called great matter, and this, I think, would surely have generated tension amongst many of those who were closest to Catherine Willoughby and also between those individuals and the king. After all, her mother's allegiance would remain resolutely with Catherine of Aragon, while Mary Tudor, wife of Charles Brandon, the man who was in charge of Catherine Willoughby's wardship, was certainly no supporter of either her brother's plans nor of his intended bride. And as for Brandon himself, he was becoming increasingly disillusioned with being sent on various trips that seemed to be designed solely to humiliate Catherine of Aragon. And on top of this, and despite the fact that he had positioned himself as a clear enemy of Cardinal Wolsey, as Anne Boleyn was, he was for some reason unable to reach any understanding with Anne Boleyn herself. Indeed, in 1531, the court faction that had grown up around Anne Boleyn, as she came ever closer to becoming Queen of England, started to put about a rumour. This rumour stated that Charles Brandon was showing just a little bit too much interest in his beautiful young ward Catherine, especially considering that she was set to become his daughter-in-law. Vicious stuff, no doubt. But considering what happens next, what we're about to look at, it is just possible that they were coming from a place of truth. That maybe this rumour mill had a point. Catherine Willoughby's intended mother-in-law, Mary, died on the 25th of June, 1533. At her funeral, on the 20th of July, 1533, Catherine Willoughby and her mother, Maria, were among the chief mourners. With the loss of his wife, Charles Brandon also lost her dower payments that she had been entitled to from her time as Queen of France. So perhaps then, financial constraints combined with personal preference in order to guide what would happen next. Eustace Chapuis provides September the 7th, 1533 as the date, a date that was a little less than three months after Mary Tudor's death, when her widower Charles Brandon, who at that time was aged nearly 50, married Catherine Willoughby, his former ward. She was 14. Melissa Franklin Harkrider reminds us that despite the age gap and the scandal that came from a father marrying his son's intended bride, Catherine's mother Maria, quote, supported the match, which elevated her daughter in rank and provided a generous jointure for her. Of course, that didn't stop others from being scandalised by the match. And when, at the start of the following March, 1534, Charles's son and Catherine's former intended spouse died, there were those, romantically minded, sure, who made the claim that this couple's marriage had been the cause of his death, that the shock of it had done him in. If, though, Shapwe gives us the correct marriage date for this couple, then Catherine and Charles were married on the very same day that Anne Boleyn gave birth to Elizabeth. If Elizabeth had been a boy, then perhaps Catherine of Aragon would have been left alone. As it was, she wasn't. And perhaps that's why Charles Brandon was commissioned to encourage, shall we say, Catherine of Aragon to finally recognise her marriage as annulled. This was an unenviable task that would earn him the ire of Catherine of Aragon and presumably, to varying degrees, the disapproval of his new wife and her family. 
There was clearly a substantial age difference between the Suffolks, but seemingly this marriage was a successful, even a happy one. The couple would have two children. Henry was born in 1535 and then a couple of years later, a second child, Charles, arrived. As for Brandon, his advancement had come in large part through his ability to both win and maintain the favour of the king, a king who he had of course grown up alongside. Brandon's new wife was beautiful and well-educated, and she also had a mother who had, and indeed would continue, to show her that displays of tenacity, loyalty and resolutely strong will were both fitting and apt for her to emulate. When Maria learned of Catherine of Aragon's ill health, she repeatedly petitioned for permission to go and visit her at Kimbolton. These requests would be denied. Undeterred, she made the decision to travel from London to Kimbolton without the required or expected permission. Upon arriving, she announced that she was simply too badly injured to ride any further, following a frankly convenient fall from her horse. She had arrived just in time. Maria had reached Kimbolton in the late afternoon of the 1st of January 1536, and due to this professed injury, she was given permission to stay with and care for her former mistress until Catherine's death on the 7th of January 1536. Maria then stayed with her body until her funeral on the 22nd of that month. Maria would be one of the principal mourners, as was her daughter, Catherine, Duchess of Suffolk. The chief mourner was this Duchess's stepdaughter, Eleanor, who had become, by marriage, the Countess of Cumberland in the previous year. Catherine and Eleanor had in fact grown up together in the Brandon household. Indeed, they were the same age, having both been born in 1519. Catherine had certainly begun her life as a devout Roman Catholic. Stephen Gardiner even referred to her as being, quote, as earnest as any. This was, of course, the faith of her mother, It even arguably in part underpinned her belief that Catherine of Aragon was the true wife of Henry VIII. But Maria would die three years after Catherine in May 1539. Another key influence in her life is of course going to be her husband. But when it comes to matters of faith, that is more complex because Charles Brandon's religious position and stance is much harder to grasp. In fact, I'd argue that it was probably whatever Henry VIII told him it was or should be. The political landscape at court was irrevocably altered by the fall of Anne Boleyn and much of her faction in May 1536. From this point, former, better established bonds were renewed and strengthened. Brandon would be trusted with suppressing the activities that were connected to the Pilgrimage of Grace and its aftermath, which took place from late 1536 through to 1537. Now, I do have a video on the Pilgrimage of Grace that I will be leaving linked. Unsurprisingly, Catherine would reap the rewards of her husband's ever-increasing place of trust with the king, because it brought with it additional authority and wealth, which in turn furthered her place and position as one of the great ladies of England. As Brandon's wife, but also as an individual whose personal qualities and attributes would lead to her being viewed as an ornament to any court in her own right, Catherine was a frequently invited guest to court for a host of celebratory events, including more than a couple of royal weddings. Increasingly during this period as well, the Suffolk household was starting to employ and host reformers and evangelicals. Catherine would come to leave behind the faith of her mother to follow this path instead. On the 12th of July, 1543, Henry VIII married his sixth wife, Catherine Parr who may also, just like Catherine, Duchess of Suffolk, have been named in honour of Henry's first wife and queen, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine Brandon became this new queen's lady-in-waiting. They gathered together with other ladies into a reform-minded coterie, whose views, in some cases, danced on the line of what was viewed as heresy. Now, Stephen Gardiner was no longer recognising Catherine Brandon's faith to be, quote, as earnest as any. Instead, for him, 
she was part of a nest of heretics at the very heart of the royal court, a nest that must be destroyed. Seemingly, he was keen to start with the Queen herself. There were even rumours that King Henry was minded to go along with Gardiner's plans because he had now tired of his sixth wife, and because he may have thought that a better or a more attractive option had now become available to him. And this was because Henry's dear friend, former brother-in-law Charles Brandon, had died on the 22nd of August 1545. There were, and still are some, that assert that the King was looking to set aside Catherine Parr so that he could make this widow, who was by then only in her mid-twenties, his seventh wife. Queen Catherine Parr was, however, able to cajole her husband into forgiving her, and into overriding the arrest warrant that he had already signed for her in 1546. Thus, Catherine Parr made sure that both she and her close friend and companion Catherine Brandon were saved from Henry, albeit in different ways. On the 28th of January 1547, King Henry VIII died, and so the crown passed to his nine-year-old son, who became King Edward VI. This boy king, and or those who were in charge of his government, were wholly bent on faith-based reform. Catherine, now Dowager Duchess of Suffolk, became a bastion of inspiration and funding for the new religion. John Fox would feature her in his Acts and Monuments, also known as the Book of Martyrs. In it, he would report that upon passing Stephen Gardner while he was in his cell in the Tower of London, she is said to have exclaimed that, quote, It was merry with the lambs, now that the wolf was shut up. Susan Wabuda writes that, quote, Over a dozen books carried her coat of arms, or were dedicated to her including the paraphrases of Erasmus and biblical translations by William Tyndale. When the Duchess and William Cecil persuaded Catherine Parr to print her book, The Lamentation of a Sinner, in late 1547, they hoped to influence Parliament to lift the old Henrician restrictions upon Bible reading by women and the lower classes. For many theologians, the Duchess was a bright mirror for womankind, a reproach to all those who thought it was inappropriate for women to take the Gospels in their hands. She supported Protestant clergy to find livings in Lincolnshire. She promoted the career of Hugh Latimer and preserved many of his sermons by seeing to it that they went down in print. Her sons were taught by a leading reforming scholar, Martin Butcher. It seems evident to me that the plan was for her boys to continue to ardently support the Reformed faith as their mother had done. Sadly, though, Catherine's boys would not reach the potential that she clearly had in mind for them, as they would both contract sweating sickness and then die within hours of each other in 1551. They were no older than their mid-teens. The community of the Protestant faithful rallied to support Catherine with their condolences. The following year, in 1552, Catherine married Richard Bertie. He was a fellow Protestant and someone who she had previously employed to act as a gentleman usher for her. And then the year after that, in 1553, the Protestant king Edward VI died at just 16. His named successor, Jane, who was the granddaughter of Catherine's late husband, Charles Brandon, was ultimately unable to hold the country. And thus, the crown passed to Edward's elder, Roman Catholic half-sister, Mary. With the change in faith, Stephen Gardner was now out of danger, out of the tower, and on the warpath. He set about interrogating Richard Bertie about his and his wife's faith, Catherine was, it seems, simply too rich, too prominent, and perhaps too outspoken to be left alone. Recognising the danger they were in, this couple made plans to flee into exile. Richard would leave first, and he would go quickly. He would set about making preparations so that by the start of 1555, a pregnant Catherine, their infant daughter Susan, who had been born in 1554, and their servants were able to sneak out of England. Catherine gave birth to her son, 
the fabulously named Peregrine while in exile in Vasel in October 1555. The family would remain abroad for the rest of Mary I's reign. When Mary died on November 17th, 1558, Catherine and her family were the guests of King Sigismund II of Poland. Indeed, John Fox would claim that this Polish king had given Catherine and her husband an almost ruling responsibility for a region of his realm. That region is modern-day Lithuania. Whatever the relationship, this couple would certainly have to settle their affairs and their responsibilities to their host before they could return to England. It is clear that Catherine had high hopes for the true faith, as she would have seen it, when on the 28th of January 1559, she wrote to her new Queen Elizabeth in congratulatory and celebratory terms. She stated, quote, Wherefore now is our season? For if the Israelites might rejoice in their Deborah, how much we English in our Elizabeth, that deliverance of our thralled conscience. I greedily wait and pray to the Almighty to consummate this consolation, giving me a prosperous journey once again presently to see your majesty, to rejoice together with my country folks, and to sing a song to the Lord in my native land. From her return to England in 1559, Catherine once again set about funding her network of Protestant writers and preachers. The famous reformer and Bible translator Miles Coverdale was the person she chose to employ to tutor her children. However, Catherine would be disappointed by some of the faith choices that were being made by Elizabeth and her government for the National Church. Elizabeth's government at this point was, interestingly, being headed by Catherine's former ally, William Cecil. If we remember, the two of them had banded together to work on Catherine Parr about publishing her book. Seemingly then, the allegiances of Edward VI's reign had now shifted, just like the character of the faith had done. Those whose career and opinions were furthered by Catherine's patronage were finding fault in the Elizabethan church's enduring, quote, popish elements, the what I like to call bells and smells, if you will. While, on the other hand, Elizabeth, her government and her church had come to view those who were part of Catherine's patronage network as being disappointingly, if not dangerously, puritanical. If Catherine had hoped that she would be able to return to England and be welcomed at court, she would be disappointed there too. Marginalisation was, in fact, a feature of Catherine's last years. She died on September the 19th, 1580, when she was 61. Her son Peregrine was recognised as heir to the barony of Willoughby de Airsby after her death, on the 11th of November, and he formally took his place in the House of Lords on the 16th of January, 1581. His title was Lord Willoughby of Willoughby, Beck and Airsby. As a follow-on fact, if you will, the Baron Willoughby de Airsby title, which was created in 1313 by King Edward II, is still held by a descendant of Catherine's today. At the time of making this video, and according to the available research, it is held by Jane Heathcote Drummond Willoughby. She is the 28th Baroness Willoughby de Airsby, and she continued the family tradition of taking up their hereditary seat in the House of Lords up until the 11th of November 1999, at which point she was excluded from the House due to the House of Lords Act. This act limited the number of hereditary peers that could sit in the Lords to 92, and she was not one of those to be selected. The current Baroness did not marry, nor did she have children, and so her title will pass to other relatives of hers. But they are also descendants of Catherine Willoughby. But what do you think of the life and legacy of Catherine Willoughby? Did any parts of her story surprise you? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. Or you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. 
please follow me over on some or all of those so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please share it with your friends. In fact, if you like my channel, let some of your pals know about it. Maybe they will enjoy it too. And you can let me know you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Also, if you have something to say, please drop it in the comments or pop an emoji down there. All interaction is super useful and lets the algorithm know that people like my videos and so more people will hopefully see them. I'd love it as well if you would subscribe to this channel and just check now, I say it every week. At some point, maybe I will be able to stop, but now is not that time. If you think you're subscribed, have a check now. Make sure YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you're there checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, you will notice that beside the subscribe button, there is a little bell icon. Hit the bell icon and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that means, allegedly, that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded and also when I am planning to go live, which I do mostly on a Monday. Occasionally that day might switch. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.